Thank you so much. Um, it is an incredible honor to be here and uh, to address this audience. I uh, thank the organizers. Um, <clears throat> um, you're talking of influencing. I, I was taken back to my, my first job. Uh, not actually a job, but, uh, well, I guess it was. You know, my first job was selling Avon cosmetics uh, to white women uh, in the United States, okay? Here is an Asian brown woman, you know, um, selling Avon cosmetics, and I'm sure, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with this. Uh, uh, this was, I think, one of the first ever successful door-to-door uh, -door, uh, sales uh, campaign. And uh, I was very young. This was like almost uh, 40 years ago, um, you know, a uh, young mother. And uh, my husband went to school in the United States, and there was no money for anything else. And so I said, fine, you know, I will... Uh, 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 sell, sell makeup. And uh, when you talk of influencing people, it's all about talking. It's all about, uh, I won't even use the word communication. I, I would say talk. You know, uh, the words you use uh, and the power uh, that goes behind the words that you use. Um, Max Foundation. I've been with the Max Foundation for almost 18 years now. In fact, May 15th was yesterday. May 15th, 2001 was the day I joined the Max Foundation. And I'm very happy to say that it's been a very incredible um, uh, period for me. Max was uh, this young boy who died of a very rare uh, leukemia. It's called chronic myeloid leukemia. And uh, his, uh, he was from Latin America. They, his, he and his family, they came to North America looking for treatment options. And um, he died in, in less than three years. And uh, the family decided to put their three-year experience to use and uh, see how they could help other uh, Hispanic uh, um, parents of, uh, you know, um, children and how they could make life easier for them, help them to understand what it means to cope with the disease in their midst and stuff like that. I would like to make this clear because many people in India, when we say Max, they think, oh, yeah, Max uh, Hospitals or Max Bupa or so. I mean, Max in India is now Max Healthcare. Um, so our mission is to increase global access uh, to patients for treatment, especially in low and middle income countries. And we work in uh, uh, Asia Pacific, South Asia, Latin America, uh, Africa, Central Asia. That, and this is our basic. Uh, so now, it was very interesting when I was asked to speak at this conclave, saying, how do we work uh, with patients uh, in, 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 in the interiors? Because that is what we actually do. We have a, a very large uh, patient assistance program where thousands of patients uh, receive a drug uh, at no cost. Uh, in fact, this is a drug for the exact cancer that Max died of, chronic myeloid leukemia. It's a chronic cancer. Um, this drug burst into the firmament of cancer treatment in, well, exactly 18 years ago. And, uh, uh, it's a pill that you take, uh, um, and it keeps your cancer under control. It's sort of cure. What it did actually was uh, convert a uh, fatally uh, uh, a fatal illness into a chronic manageable condition. Now, um, these are photographs of our patients in Kanpur, and I, what I've tried to do is, you know, I've tried to have pictures from every um, uh, little town that we visited. Don't tell anybody from Kanpur. I said Kanpur was a little town, please. Okay, but you know, towns other than Bombay, Delhi, Madras, uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, you know, there are, there are, uh, um, there's so much of uh, 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 the, the patients we deal with come from, from all over the, the length and breadth of this, of this country. So a chronic condition, needs constant medication, monitoring, and management. At the Max Foundation, because we look after the donation program for this particular uh, disease, this is what we have to do. And the impact of a diagnosis of cancer on a family is, is sometimes goes beyond, beyond our imagination. There are financial, emotional, sociocultural, all kinds of factors that come onto it. 
85% of our patients live in the interiors. And their challenges are not just financial. There's fear, there is stigma, there is isolation, and they find it very difficult to break through these barriers, even to come and access treatment. There are a lot of myths around cancer. There's discrimination at the workplace, the strained relationship within the family and the socio-cultural framework. Cancer manje mouth, cancer is a death sentence, and cancer is, um, is, is your punishment for some sins you may have committed. Uh, the, the kind of stigma that is still attached to a disease like cancer is, is heartbreaking because it actually comes in the way of, of a person um, trying to cope with the loss and trying to build a life all over again, trying to find a new normal. Uh, when we talk to, talk to our patients, you know, we, we realize that, like all of us, we're all on this journey of life, you know, life at birth, it begins here, and then till end of life. Now, during this journey, we are there, you know, with our friends, with our family, with our colleagues, with our neighbors. Um, we are not, we don't look at end of life. We are not really troubled by end of life. That's our destination, but we are on this life, which is, which is something we are, uh, we, we spending time together with each other. We are working uh, and all of a sudden, this, this comfortable journey of life is interrupted. Um, you're asked to get off at a stop saying here, this is, this is where you have to get off this journey and that stop is called cancer since we are talking about cancer now. So you're asked to get off at this lonely place and you know, you're alone and you're, you're in shock. You don't want to do that. You don't want to get off there. You want to be back on that journey along with you know, everybody else you were with and here you are isolated. After a while, somebody else gets down there. And after some more time, yet another person, and then yet another person. And then you find that you're not really alone. You have somebody else who is facing the same situation that you are in. And maybe you, know, you get collect some kind of courage from the fact that there are two or three or four more people there undergoing the same trauma that you are. You look around and you actually find support from other quarters also. So this is very important, and this is the, what a support group actually does. You know, getting people together who are facing the same traumatic conditions, and then they tell each other, you know what, this is not end of life for us. We should be able to find a new normal. We should be able to maybe not get back on the same track, but on another track. And we continue towards the common destination. It's a parallel track. We realized, you know, working with these thousands of patients who were on this donation program that we were managing. So when I, when I joined the Max Foundation 18 years ago, I was given a, a file of 22 patients who were on the trial for this specific drug that I was talking about. It's a drug called Gleevec, and the manufacturers are Novartis. And Novartis had put in place this donation program. In fact, it's far more lower, actually. You know, Dan Vasella, who was the, uh, the CEO of Novartis at that time, they had come out with this magic bullet. Uh, it had made the cover of Time magazine at that time, I remember. And, uh, there was this press conference and um, apparently somebody stood up and said, that's wonderful, you have this, this magic bullet, you have this wonderful drug that's going to keep you know, a cancer patient, uh, you're going to give him quality of life, you're going to give him extension of life, but it costs a whopping $2,000 per month and it is lifelong therapy. So how is anybody going to be able to afford this kind of uh, medication? And Dan Vasella stood up and said, any patient who doesn't have recourse to insurance, who doesn't have access to reimbursement, and who doesn't have money, private means of his own, the company will donate the drug. And believe me, that's what the company has been doing. Into its 18th year, there are thousands of patients in India who are on this drug, who are living their lives as normally as you and I can, on the surface. But because we've been working with these thousands and thousands of patients, we know that this is a big stress on them. They are living with cancer, and living with cancer is not easy. We decided to put together these patients from these different towns, you know, and we said, let's bring them together so that together they share and learn from each other. 
what did we do? We identified patient leaders from every town. We put them together in WhatsApp groups. Today, everybody has a phone. The WhatsApp groups have become such an important medium of communication. Of course, we have to teach them. No forwards, no good mornings, no happy this, no happy that. This is just to let you know when the next meeting is going to take place, if somebody has a question, if there is some doubt, something that has to be cleared, if you have to introduce a new person into the group. And of course, social media. My patients love being on Facebook. You know, there was a time when they would say, nay, abhi, kisi ko humne bataya nahi hai. And then it's come to now, Amma ji, hume aapne photo pe tag nahi kiya. This is amazing, you know, this is amazing. The way we have been able to use social media to bring our patients together. And not just here, we have these, we, I look after the South Asia region, so we have these groups in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, Pakistan, and we are all, it's really one big family. Now, identifying patient leaders we thought would not be easy. We thought it would be difficult, but it was very, very simple because People want to come up there and they want to say, yes, I have cancer and I want to do my bit. You will not believe this. Yesterday, I got a call from a 70-year-old lady who lives in Thane. She says, I've just recovered from breast cancer. I want to go. I want to go to the hospitals. I want to meet people who've just been operated and I want to tell them, look at me. Look at me, my hair's come back and I'm fit and fine. So that is the picture I want a newly diagnosed patient to see. And that is what we do, we do through our outreach programs. Let our patients know that there is life after cancer, there is life during cancer, and there is nothing that can really take away from you what is yours. Cancer is all about loss. And then, you know, we work in cancer care, we hear people saying, you know, um, somebody lost the battle against cancer, or uh, it's a fight, and, which is fine, you know. You, you, can, you can define your experience in any way you want to, any way that makes you comfortable. When I talk of a campaign, I call it a crusade. A crusade is something, you know, you go out into the community, you go out into your area of expertise, and you reclaim what you have lost. Cancer takes away many things from patients. Cancer takes away self-esteem, cancer takes away self-respect, cancer takes away jobs, cancer takes away relationships, cancer takes away physical appearance, cancer takes away many things. But there are ways and means of going out there and getting it back, and that is what we do through our outreach programs. In our meetings, in all these towns that we go to, whether it is Bhopal or Mangalore or Dharwad or Bhuvaneshwar or Ranchi or Raipur, Coimbatore, Madurai, any of these towns we go to, we train our patient leaders. We give them volunteer training programs. There are compliance workshops. We make quizzes, the, the, the cancers that they are being treated for. Do you know about your cancers? We do art therapy. We do drama therapy. Every single patient matters however young, however old, however whatever, every single patient matters. And I really you know, wish you could be with, in one of these workshops we do. My favorite is the music workshop. We don't call it music therapy, that's something else altogether. What's a workshop? A workshop is where you are active. You, you know, these are patients who are in a room. In fact, we have an audience, we have audiences even larger than these. Like in our meetings in Patna, in our meetings in Bhuvaneshwar, our meetings in Raipur, we have like, 350 odd patients and caregivers in the room. We divide them into groups, colored badges, and then after lunch, lunch is like a, you know, it's like a, the group meetings we organize is actually like a wedding. We have to book a hall. Invariably, the auditorium, the hospitals give us their auditoriums at no cost. And we get in touch with a good caterer and there's food. You know, these patients come from distances. They come with their bags and they come take an early morning bus and they'll come. And so they have to have breakfast. We give them lunch. They have, there's nashta with chai, with evening chai. Now, a music workshop, we divide the people into groups according to their colors. It's after lunch. Everybody gets up. and. Talk to them about what music is all about, where the first musical sounds came from. Maybe it's the voice of the coil. Maybe it's the voice of the, you know, the sound of the, uh, the rain falling on the roof of your house. Could be anything. And then we talk to them about different genres of music. Talk to them about where ragas came from, what you can do with the seven sur, and make it really fun. Give each group 
10 minutes to prepare one particular you know, um, musical um, item. And then they come on stage and they perform. And what are these genres? It could be uh, Sugam Sangeet, like a ghazal, it can be a bhajan, it can be a classical song, and the most popular is a Hindi film song. Or if you are in the South, a Malayalam film song or a Tamil film. So we say film music. You should see the way these patients and their caregivers get together. And they come up on stage and they sing. And they come and tell us afterwards, Kabhi pehle stage pe nahi gaya humne, bohut achcha laga. You know, each, there is, there is a performer, there is an exhibitionist, there is a artist within each one of us. And somehow when you become, when you're diagnosed with a disease, you suddenly become a patient and you become like something apart from everybody else. So in our intervention programs, we bring them back into the fold. You're no different, nobody is different from anybody else. So, and drama therapy, the talent, the talent that is there in each one of us and the bonding. These are people in a group, everybody with a green badge, everybody with an orange badge, with your yellow badge, they've never interacted with each other before and then they go back so bonded like a family member. It's not all fun all the time, it's a lot of serious work also. We are so indebted to our oncologists. In every town, we have the oncologists come to our meetings one-on-one -on -one with the patients. You know, normal in an OPD, a patient gets about three minutes or four minutes with his treating physician or her treating physician. At our meetings, they sit like this, face-to-face -face answering their questions. We print and we translate and we distribute a lot of disease information material. Patients love doing that. And Getting, coming up on stage and talking, sharing their testimonials. Together we share and learn, and like I said, it's bonding, it's finding another family, you're discovering a new normal. These are things that actually happen when these meetings go on. Um, patient support group meetings, our WhatsApp groups, we have an email group, and we have, I have uh, 18 people who work with me. We, together, we have collective knowledge of almost all the languages that are spoken in India, including Nepali, uh, and a little bit of a smattering of Sinhalese, even though our patients in Sri Lanka, we are able to communicate with them in Tamil and English, a lot of it. This, this uh, um, uh, relationship that the team has uh, with the patients, it's long term. I've seen a five-year-old boy grow into a 20-year-old youngster. I've seen a 10-year-old girl grow into a 28-year-old 20, young woman. We've seen patients get married. We've seen patients have children. We've seen patients become grandparents. We've seen patients marry their children off, change jobs. And they go about life as anybody else would. And through our interventions, we try and make it as easy for them to come back, look for their new normal, come back to what they have to do. All a patient wants is to live in dignity and with hope. That is what we try and give our patients. I will stop now. If there are any questions, anything, most welcome. Yep. Chai for cancer, yeah, that, that's, that's a good idea, okay. Um, so we do these, uh, we work with these patients and uh, on paper uh, they get their drug um, at no cost. They have to come uh, to see their treating physician every um, three months, uh, which means like uh, four trips to a major treatment center. And uh, I found many of my patients falling off uh, uh, my radar actually, uh, despite the fact that they were getting these, uh, uh, the medication at no cost, they did not have resources to come and collect it. Um, Ram Babu Mahato from uh, somewhere in Bihar, he used to drive a truck. He was a young man with uh, two little children and uh, he would come with the children and his wife. Uh, he's, his thekedar threw him out of the job. 
because he had cancer and he had no money and he was very irregular. We teach our patients little how to manage their finances. And, but this man was doing very well and then I suddenly realized we hadn't seen him in about eight months. And then when he came to us, uh, I said, kya ho gaya? Aap, uh, nahi ho. Dawai kap ki aapki khatam ho gayi hogi? So he said, haan, bahut pata nahi, ulti aati hai, to hum peen le nahi sakte. I said, doctor se baat ki? Haan, doctor sahab ne kaha, ek glas dood se pee lo. Ek glas dood ke saath pee liya karo. So I am like telling him, to dood ke saath pee ho na? So he says, amma ji, dood ka paisa hota, mein apne bete ko deta, mein nahi peeta. It, it, it struck me that this, that this family has no funds. Or there's the other case of this gentleman who, whose son, 12 years old or something, and he used, he, they lived in a slum in Malad. He came to office one day, cycl he cycled all the way to our office in Varli because he did not have the money to pay the bus fare and he just took a cycle from somebody in his, his Ados Pados neighbor and he came to collect his son's medication. You know, um, when we saw this, we realized we need to do something, just the medicine is just not enough. Some, if we are managing the program, I honestly felt I was responsible for compliance. And what was the major reason for non-compliance in these patients was they did not have the resources to come and collect their medication. They did not have the resources to go and see their doctor every three months. They did not have the resources. There was this, there was this young girl who said she hadn't been going to, going to school because Papa ne kaha, is bar aapka blood test ke liye hi paisa hai, school ke fees ke liye paisa nahi hai. So we were sitting, this patient group that we have formed called Friends of Max, it's a registered trust with the Charities Commissioner here, and the trustees are all patient leaders themselves. And I said, listen guys, we have to do something. Otherwise, thousands of patients are going to go off the drug and they're going to die, because I saw that happening too. And fundraising, believe me, it's the most difficult thing. I had sworn to myself in my previous you know, um, work I had done with another non profit I'll never get into fundraising. But then you have to, it's a hard fact of life. You need resources. Anything you want to do, you want to help anybody, you need resources. There was a cup lying in front of my, in my desk, you know, it's got all the pens stuffed into it. I had been to Australia in 1995 for a, for a fellowship and to the Queensland Cancer Fund, I had been taken to a fundraiser called Australia's Biggest Tea and Coffee Morning and I had bought that mug for $5. I had had chai, I had, I had had tea and I had cake and stuff there. And I had to pay for my plate and for my chai, which went to funding for the Australian Cancer Society. This was 1995, do your math. This was like 20 something odd years ago. And all these days that mug has been lying on my table. I picked it up and I told my patient leaders, I said, you know what, we can do this. We can do chai for cancer. I'm going to have a chai adda in my home a month from today. And this was sometime in April. And a month from that day was the second Sunday of May. Coincidence, Mother's Day. Second Sunday of May 2014, I had an adda in my house. I used social media. I made an event. I called everybody I knew. Um, People came home, there was chai, there was samosa and jalebi, and there was biryani, and then there was cake, and they came. I don't know, I think around 86 or odd people must have walked into my little apartment that day. And they went back paying for the chai, and we raised a lakh and 20,000 in just that one day. <laughs> from our well-wishers, from family. So then I became emboldened, you know. I went online with it, and I said, okay, 100 rupees for a cup of chai, minimum. 100 rupees for one cup of chai. If one person in all of the year would do that, we would have money to save lives of cancer patients. Other patients did chai for cancer addas in their homes. Virji Bhatt in Jammu, uh, JP Tiwari in Bhopal, Manoj Patidar in Indore, Suresh Subramaniam in Bangalore, Archana in Coimbatore, uh, Kartigayan in Udmal Petai, Nandini in Madras, uh, Usha Kant in Ahmedabad, O.P. Agarwal in Bhuvaneshwar. They had addas in their homes and they called their friends, their neighbors over. Very simple, very straightforward. Ghar aye chai pije, chai ka kimat aapko aada karna hai. And that price is priceless. The price you pay for that chai is priceless. There is a little adda we've set up outside. You can go and have a look. This is, we've completed the fifth year. We've started the sixth season. Um, we have partners like uh, Red FM, 
the 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 the, the uh, RGs are talking about it. Red FM offices host Addas. Hospitals host Addas today. I'm going to Delhi tomorrow. Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute is hosting an Adda day after tomorrow. We host Addas in Lodi Garden in uh, in um, Kaban Park. It's caught the imagination. It's caught the fancy of people. People are telling me, I'd love to have you over. I'd love to have people over to my house because we've lost this this whole uh, rivaz, you know, of ghar me kisi ko bulana. No, no, okay, let's go and have a coffee somewhere there. Let's meet somewhere there. There we are people coming to your house and a uh, chai for cancer adda is uh, is uh, like tea is something chai is something you can have anywhere with anybody at any time of the day how many ever times it's the most most non intimidating most ordinary thing in the world and i wanted to bring cancer into an environment like that into a mahal like that cancer so we can talk of cancer there is no fear there is no stigma there are, there are no restraints there is no loss there is nothing cancer is is just a disease disease you do Sandhi Vichyad of disease, it's, I guess, absence of ease. That's it. Nothing. It is not a death sentence. It's only a word. The sixth Chai for Cancer Adda at my home was held on Sunday, which was Mother's Day. I don't know. The hordes of people there. I have a very tiny little apartment in Thani. But it just kind of expands. People just come and go, come and go. And we spoke, we shared, we sang, we ate, we drank. And I think 50% of the people went home only after Mumbai Indians had won the match against the Chennai Super Kings. Let me stop now. You know, I, uh, I talk a lot. <laughs> so the Adda is there outside for all of you today. Please go and take a look and donate your chai to Chai for Cancer today to help our patients from the length and breadth of our country. Thank you.